All right. Hello, everybody. This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just want to thank you very much for your time in advance. I'm going to start off with a risk disclaimer. I'm going to keep this up for about 10 seconds, and then we'll get right on to the live charts. As usual, this webinar is all about you, ladies and gentlemen. So setups you have, pairs you want to take a look at, fire those my way. I will do my absolute best to answer as many as I can when we get to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Uh, now, today is going to be a little bit shorter than usual. I have a meeting to attend at the top of the hour, so I'm going to try to cut the total session down to about a half hour, meaning about 20 minutes of uh, charts or markets that I wanted to look at and about 10 minutes for Q&A. So as usual, just fire away. Let me know what's on your mind. I'll do my absolute best to answer as much as I can. we we'll get to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and bring on the chart, start chopping this up market by market, piece by piece. And it's been a pretty interesting backdrop since we looked, we last looked at matters on Tuesday. Uh, USD weakness has come right back into play. We're seeing the dollar test those weekly lows that were in uh, uh, last week, last Thursday to be exact. There we go. Coming in right around 98.66. And this was helped along by some inflation data earlier this morning. Headline inflation remaining sub 2%, printed at 1.7 for the second consecutive month. Core inflation, however, remains pretty hot. Second consecutive month at 2.4%. Last month was a really big surprise there, and it held for a second consecutive month. Now, with that said, I don't know how impactful that's going to be on the October rate decision, um, especially considering that there's a lot of other factors at play right now. So rather than dabbling around the theoretical, I want to get to the actual and looking at price action, legitimate price movements that may be showing what's around that next corner. Um, so on that topic, US dollar, and this is something that I've been following for a little while now, reversal potential and USD. Now, coming into Q4, this thing had a full head of steam, rallied up to a fresh two-year high on the first trading day. That was last Tuesday. Since then, there's been a turnaround effect here. Uh, last week had some negative US data, speaking specifically about those ISM reports on Tuesday and then Thursday, and that helped to elicit a bit of a turn off that trend line projection, making up the resistance side of the rising wedge. We've had some continuation of that theme this week, mostly helped by today's precipitous drop. Now, there was another factor that had come into play that I believe might even have more bearing on the matter than what we saw around this morning's CPI report, and that was the ECB meeting minutes release. Those ECB meeting minutes did not sound as dovish as what many are looking for around the European Central Bank. Correspondingly, that really big area of confluent resistance that we followed on Euro dollar on Tuesday, it's now been broken through. That 110 handle, uh, even like I was saying then, it almost seemed too clean for comfort, especially given the prices that already ran down and moved towards that 109 and a quarter level that had previously come in as, as support two different times in early September. Well, sure enough, Bears had every chance in the world to take advantage of that thing when it was wedging right up around 110. It didn't matter, did it? And the same exact reason I did not want to look at short side sets on Tuesday is what's ended up playing out. U.S. dollar weakness, euro strength on the back of those less than dovish or less than expected dovish F uh, ECB meeting minutes. And at this point, the euro is actually showing a bit of bullish potential. Prices have broken above that bearish trend line that connects the swing highs from June, August, and September. Notice that breakout that took place a little earlier this morning. Prices pulled back and found a bit of support around prior resistance, around that 110 handle, around that trend line projection. And I'd written this in the aftermath report of that CPI release earlier today. Give me a quick second, and I will be happy to share that with you. It's right in here. And as I had said on this Euro theme, given the quick dash of dollar strength that had played in after the immediate release of that CPI report, the door was open for dollar strength to elicit that pullback towards that 110 handle. Now that chart was from a little earlier today, around 9.30 a.m. And that's what started to fill in. So while I would not summarize this as one of the more attractive short USD plays currently available, uh, that is the side that I would favor on Euro dollar right now. 
given the fact that prices have broken above that confluent resistance, that they have continued to track up to a fresh, I believe we're at about a two and a half week high right now. Yeah, two and a half week high. And even coupled with a bit of a pullback to find support around prior resistance. All right, and I see there's a lot of comments here. I don't wanna, I was gonna save this one for later because I really don't like to fan my own, my own, um, think of a polite way of saying this. I try not to fan my own wins that widely because I'm a pretty cynical trader and I'm, <laughs> I'm almost of the belief that if I, I brag too loudly, the gods of trading are going to smite me. But um, so you're all, I'm going to keep on the short side of the USD radar. The one that I looked at on Tuesday for short side USD plays, and I even caught a little bit of flack from a couple of people asking how I could possibly look at the long side of the British pound after uh, such a nasty scenario had developed around Brexit. Well, I mean, I even went on my soapbox, talked about the efficient market hypothesis for a good 10, 15 minutes as to why I thought it was still a good play or a good idea, specifically on the short side of the US dollar. Because uh, at the time, there just wasn't a lot that was setting up attractively for dollar weakness. Uh, cable was the setup that I had settled on, or one of them, one of the two that I'd settled on. And it was basically just a simple tech play with a bit of humility admitting that, look, I can't read the headlines. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. Sure, Briggs is nasty. And as an American, I have very little tactile touch with the matter itself. I mean, they're not asking me to vote in these referendums, right? So to me, the headlines, it's honestly gotten a bit silly. And I'm sure many other folks outside of the U.S. think the same thing about our politics. I wouldn't disagree. This is the truth. But Regardless of that silliness, the Goldman Sachs of the world, they're not dummies, right? And if prices come down and wedge into an area of support, specifically an area of support that's already showed a tendency to cauterize that bleeding, then at the very least, it opens the door for stops on the other side, looking for asymmetric risk reward ratios. Well, today is a good example as to why that approach, in my opinion at least, could be helpful. Because news can help me, news can hurt me, and there's no way that I can predict what tomorrow's going to bring. But if prices are even reasonably efficient, and if all known news at a given moment in time, or most of that known news, is factored in, as in if I know for a fact that there's no free lunch out there because the Goldman Sachs of the world aren't stupid, and if I respect my opponent, well, then that at least opens the door for little areas to risk a dollar to try to make two, and sometimes I could get four, five, or six out of the matter. And as you can see today, the British pound has been on an absolute rampage. And sure, there's a couple of headlines that I could share with you. As a matter of fact, if we just scan over to daily effects real fast, I bet we're talking about some of them. There we go. Breaking news, UP extends after Varadkar Johnson meeting up over 1%. I mean, this thing's just continuing to run. Oh, there we go. They're even on the top headline right now, All right? But I'm never going to be able to predict that stuff, right? So I don't even try. What I instead try to do is look for little areas or pockets of opportunity where I could try to risk a dollar in the effort of making two. And sometimes I could get that nice topside surprise or might be able to make four or five or six off that initial dollar outlay. And that's what I have right now on the British pound. Uh, so at this stage, and like I had said in the last webinar, I'm not just going to spend the whole time here talking my book. Oh, I was long a couple hundred pips ago. Good luck going forward. No, I want to try to set this up as if I have nothing going on, how I'd want to approach it moving forward. Uh, fact of the matter is this thing has run an aggressive topside rally that I do not want to chase. We're now perched up to fresh October highs, pulling back a bit uh, after testing above that 124 level. Do not want to chase this right now. I have absolutely no interest in buying it whilst it highs. Instead, I want to wait for this to pull back. And there's a level right in here a zone, if you will, that feels a lot more accommodated for playing pullbacks. It's a nice little 15 pip zone that runs from this Fibonacci retracement at 123.43 up to this swing high, 123.57. If this thing could pull back to find some support within that zone, I could look for bullish trend continuation strategies aiming for a retest of the 125 psychological level. I could even color that up to the 125.23 level for a nice little 23 pip resistance zone if you will. Now, if that falls flat, which look, let's be honest, if it's this headline that's driving the matter, that could get eviscerated just as quickly as it got priced in. So if this pop falls flat, 
that same approach can remain true around 122.70. That's the 50 fib of the September rally. Oh, not that one, this one. That's the 50 fib of the September rally. That's a level that has elicited a couple of different dashes of support already. Even gave us a bit of resistance earlier. Earlier this week, that is. Right in there. We haven't yet retested that for support. So even if this rally falls flat, I'm going to keep this on the short side of the US dollar radar, looking for pullback to either 123 and a half or 122 and three quarters, each of which keeps the door open for topside continuation, targeting that retest of the 125 to 125 23 zone. Also on the short side of the US dollar, dollar CAD. This one's beginning to fill in a little bit. Pete says, guys, hassling you regarding cameras feel like Roberts after putting Kershaw in. <laughs> it's a baseball joke for those that uh, don't follow the great American pastime. But yeah, I don't get too much hassle. Um, kind of make it a point anytime somebody tries to <laughs> make a scene, I make sure they don't try to do it again. You know, as George Bush said, Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. Ain't gonna fool me again. <laughs> uh, okay, getting back to the matter. Um, Dollar CAD. So I looked at this one also on Tuesday as one of my favorite short side USD plays. This one hasn't really shown a lot of promise yet, but it is beginning to show some signs of sellers being able to tiptoe a bit deeper below that 133 handle. Um, I'm gonna contrast this one with dollar yen here in a minute which I think sets up for a pretty interesting hedge scenario around the U.S. dollar, looking for short dollar plays. Oh, I'll show you here in a minute. But um, I'm going to keep dollar CAD on the short side of the USD radar because we are starting to finally see bears break a little bit of fresh ground. Uh, it's still very at the very early stage. We're in somewhat of a danger zone here between 132.50, 133. This was an area that had previously given some pretty good resistance. But after we broke above that last week, it can't really be used for the same type of motive, in my opinion. So what I'm looking for now is a shorter term view. Looking for that drive down to fresh lows earlier this morning to recover a bit. And then I'm looking for resistance in this area about five pips away up to that 133 handle. If I get a hold of resistance there, I got a couple different options for stop place. But one's right up here at 3320. Or more conservatively, I could go above 33 and a half. Now, both of those are rather wide risk outlays. Well, this one's a little tighter, but this one above 33 and a half, it's a rather wide risk outlay. I might be looking at as much as 55 pips of risk on the initial portion of the lot. Now, I could justify that, but I have to see prices move down for a retest of that same 132.28 level that we had looked at in the end of September. That gave me a little bit better than a 1.1 on that initial piece out. Secondary targets, that same 132 level, but perhaps more attractively, I want to look for prices to retest that big zone from 3132 up to 3150. That same zone that would help catch the September lows. Big zone of support there. Okay, I got to hustle because, like I said, I don't have as much time today. Uh, dollar yen. So again, remember, the dollar has been weak today, but not as weak as the Japanese yen, right? Because even with that dollar weakness that we're seeing so far today, dollar yen is running up to fresh highs and brings up Sean Lloyd's comment here, pound yen. It's like a bull in a china shop. This thing is running. Remember that 33.75 level that I looked at on Tuesday? It seemed almost nonsensical. But here we are a couple days later. Not only is it back in play, we've traded through that. Pretty good illustration of how aggressive this yen weakness has been. Um, now, that plays in dollar yen as well, right? Rallying up to a fresh high, catching a bit of resistance off that 107.95 level. Similar story here. I don't want to chase it while at fresh highs. I want to look for this thing to pull back, find support off that prior resistance around 107.50. But this is becoming one of the more attractive long USD plays on my radar right now, given that additional yen weakness that's been getting priced in. Pull back to 107.50, reopens the door for top side. A couple different areas to look at for stop placement. If I want to squeeze that risk, 107 and a third. There's a little swing low, not too far away. A bit deeper, there's the Fibonacci level at around 107. Also gets below that spike low from yesterday. I feel a lot more comfortable there. 
downside to that is I basically need to see this break out to fresh highs off a 107.50 support hit and a stop below 106.98. So I would need this thing to stretch and reasonably need to look for a third test of that 108.47 to 108.70 zone. Now, it has been a play a couple of times in the very recent past, but I would need this to stretch a bit longer to be able to justify um, that wider stop on the initial risk outlay. So it's that 107.33 level that's probably going to come into play, for me at least, on stop placement for topside positions. But, you know, like I've talked about a lot in these webinars, it's often the deductive reads that could be the most beneficial. The fact of the matter is even with the dollar weak, dollar yen is going up. That shows you yen weakness far more important right now, or at least has been this, this morning. And if that's a theme that could continue, then fantastic. I'll roll with that trend. But not at any cost. I'm not just going to chase this thing whilst it highs, hoping that it might work out. But good setup, in my humble opinion. All right, also on the long side of the U.S. dollar, Aussie dollar. Setup I've been following for a little while now. Now, there's a couple of different things going on here. And some similarities to that euro dollar setup that I looked at a moment ago. Now, in euro dollar, as I shared, I'm ready to flip to the long side and start looking for bullish setups. Uh, Aussie dollar, uh, some similarities in the fact that we just broke above a bearish trend line that it connected some recent swing highs. Broke above the swing highs that it played in yesterday, earlier this week. So, I mean, by all intents and purposes, if I'm watching this in like a two-hour or an hourly chart, it looks bullish. And it looks like something that's ready to go. Now, I'm not as encouraged on the matter. And I still like this one lower for a couple of different reasons. Primarily what we're seeing right now is that hold of resistance around 67.75. Because if we look at these dollar pairs elsewhere, right, like Euro dollar, you see the way that we're just smashing above those prior swing highs that have played in earlier in October? Or even, I mean, we looked at that one already, but, you know, kind of similar here. It's just smashing through those prior swing highs that have played in earlier this month. Aussie dollar has been a lot more orderly. We just snap back. We've got to pause at that level of resistance. Now, I don't know that this is where it's going to top out, but if this were going to be a legitimately bullish theme that's right for continuation that I would have expected the buyers would have at least tipped their toes in the water for fresh highs. And that hasn't happened yet. So at this stage, for me at least, it's a waiting game. That trend line, obviously not holding anything. The waiting game is in essence going to revolve around this. Watching the way that this thing respects that 67.75 swing high that it played in last week. And then the final trading day of September. If we get a good hold around there going into the U.S. close, then I still like it for short side sets. If we break back above, cautiously bearish. If we break above 68 and a quarter, those bets are off. So working backwards, well, that then shows me as long as this thing shows some tendencies of reversals or selling uh, or seller pressure shy of that 68 and a quarter swing high. Well, not even the 68 and a quarter, the 68.10 swing high. Then I'm in business for short side setups. Now, where uh, where I like this is a longer term basis because this zone below 67, I think, is ripe for the picking at some point in Q4. I just don't know if it's here yet. Now, with that said, I am looking for dollar weakness as a net result of the fourth quarter. But on the other side of that theme, because I'm not just going to bet all of my eggs in that dollar weakness basket, I really like the short side here. Fresh decade lows came into play in August. Every time we've dipped our toe in that water, prices have bounced. It's just too cold. It's not ready for drive yet. But once this thing falls out of bed, there's a lot of room underneath for prices to run. And I'm going to have to go all the way to a monthly chart to pick some of these off. But like that level around 65, big psychological level just underneath, uh, 6250, there's a Fibonacci level here coupled with a swing low from back in February of 2009. And then, and this is like a big picture type of idea, it's 6009, just above that 60 psychological level. They help to arrest the declines all the way back in October of 2008. So I'm keeping this one on the radar. It may need a little bit longer 
until it corrects, or at the very least, I'm going to need some signal, like by waiting till the close of today's trading, to indicate that bears are in fact going to be able to hold the line. If they can, I'm in business. I'm going to look at short side sets, revisit the 67, stop to break even, then roll the dice on the rest, looking for that big picture breakout. That is what I have on the U.S. dollar. Got a couple commodity setups I wanted to look at as well, uh, and a couple of indice setups on top of that. Uh, so silver. Silver is getting pretty interesting. Let me show you this first, the gold-silver ratio. There we go. So we've looked at this a couple of times in the very recent past, and I, I think this could be a gauge for uh, evaluating which of these metals might be most opportunistic for short USD runs or short USD plays. Um, I've got silver in a really odd spot. Gold, I, I still don't like it for topside yet, but that's one of the reasons that I wanted to look at this for right now. It does look as though we're hitting some point of resistance within this gold-silver ratio, at which point it might soon turn. The bigger question is what happens around support on this ratio. Um, now, putting that into actual charts or some usable usable chart work here. So the daily chart, silver prices are currently working on an evening star pattern based off of a really big level of support. That big level of support is the 50 fib. Uh, from this major move, taking the 2015 swing low, drawing that up to the July 2016 swing high. And a number of retracements on this have remained true uh, ever since. That 50 fib is, is particularly interesting given the way that it helped to cauterize some lows last week. Look at the way that it just cuts off those candlestick bodies. It at least tells me that I'm not the only one looking at this, right? Price made another fast approach going down there earlier this morning, but bulls stepped in ahead of time. The primary problem with that right now is the fact that this is close to printing a bearish traversal formation. Okay, so I need to see the way that this one closes today. If it closes with completion of that evening star, I do not want long silver positions. If the evening star is negated, which can happen, if buyers continue to claw back those earlier losses, then I like it for uh, top side, given the fact that we have a higher low in here after buyers stepped in ahead of a key test of support. And then I can look for prices to revert to 1780. And then maybe eventually towards this big confluence zone that I have that runs between 1828 and 1838. Now, the reason that this becomes attractive is going back to that gold-silver ratio. Gold just doesn't feel ready yet. That same zone of resistance that I was talking about on Tuesday, it still holds. The bear flag formation or the potential bull flag formation, excuse me, it's still there. But notice the way that 1509 Fibonacci level has just continued to come into play to four buyers. And even saw last night where we put in a lower high. I think this thing has more of a pullback before the top side theme is ready to continue. Uh, span this back to the daily chart, and it looks like it's just ripe for the picking on the short side. Now, with that said, I'm not looking to get short gold. The top side trend that ran into Q4 was so aggressive that I don't want any part of that reversal. What I do like, however, is the fact that it may soon bring in a more attractive zone of longer term support. You don't always have to play the direct move. You could look to play the follow through or the reaction of that direct move, which is what I'm looking to do right now. Uh, so that support zone that we looked at previously around 1493 is helping to hold the lows. There's another one just a little bit further down, 1475 to 1480. That 1450 level holds some potential promise. But when we get one of those brewing bearish reversal scenarios, we got to open the door for those outlier possibilities. And that's where something like a 1421 to 1433 retest may soon come into play. But when I see this much resistance holding, I don't want to bet on a break. At least until something has changed or shifted. One of those changes or shifts that could be uh, beneficial is breaking through some of those swing lows, taking out some of those trailed stops that have likely just been getting adjusted as that bullish trend has gotten longer and longer in the tooth. 
but we're still in a possible correction, uh, corrective formation as indicated by this bull flag. Continue to hold the 1509. It's just not ready yet. Uh, okay, oil. I had written an article on this yesterday. Uh, really like the scenario that we have brewing in oil right now. It's just a prospect of timing once again, as is the nature of the beast when it comes to this beautiful field of trading. So that support zone that came into play again last week has certainly helped to hold the lows. Um, I'm a bit conflicted on this one because from a longer term perspective, I really only like it short. I just think it's going to take a little while because it's set up so clean that I think there's so many bear traps out there. There's just a lot of ways that I can mess this up. Uh, first and foremost, taking a, a shorter term look at the matter. We've now seen two different very key support tests in that zone that came into play last week. That zone runs between 50.54 and 51.70. Notice this area helped to catch the lows in June. Did it again in August. We tiptoed down there last week. Buyers came in ahead of a 50.54 retest. And since then, prices have had somewhat of a bid behind them. Now, that third test of 50.54, I don't think it's going to be so supportive. Problematic, however, is about 50 cents underneath, we have the 50 psychological level. So that means risk outlay is going to need to be kept tight. That first scale is going to be very quick. Stop to break even and then look to see if sellers can continue to push. Now, that might take a little while to leave that 50 level behind. But once we can, there's another zone of confluence that runs around 47.50. But that's not the big prize here, in my humble opinion. The big prize is 42. This is where the three-year low comes into play. Again, been tested thrice. Most recently, last Christmas Eve. I don't think the fourth test of this zone is again gonna be so supportive. There's a pocket or a vacuum underneath that price that could lead all the way down to like the 30 level. Now, I don't wanna start trading for Y and Z until we get through D and E, but that's something that could be in the cards before the end of Q4. And just case in point, look at the way that this thing reacted last Q4. Brutality. As it shed off about 75% of its value in a quarter. We had that initial recovery that lasted into April, but since then it's basically just been back and forth with aggression on both sides as indicated by these really long extended wicks. It's super easy right now to take a look at this thing and say, well, hey, Middle East, risk is flaring. I mean, you look at the headlines, I'm sure there's a bunch of Trump things that we could say and et cetera. But there's another side of that matter. There's a reason this thing's pegged down to support right now. And that is that the world is awash in oil. At least that's the headline that I read earlier this morning. I'm not going to give that too much credence because this is what I'm following for what might be around that next corner. So a break below 50.54 opens the door for a 50 retest, which opens the door for a 47.50 test. 45 is along the way, but it's that 42 area around the three-year lows that remains very, very, very interesting. All right, last but certainly not least, the SPOOs, S&P 500. Um, my game plan here is exactly the same as it has been. Play swings, fade wicks, look for prices to re-enter zones, tight risk plays, then look for the headlines to do me more favors than harm. Um, we're not at a good level right now, in my humble opinion. A bit higher is that same zone of resistance that I had looked at last week, runs between around 29.56 and around 29.66. There's also a trend line projection in that area. The support that I looked at on Tuesday ended up working out fairly well around that 2900 level. Nice little top side bounce. The price is now working on a fresh, yeah, fresh three day high. So, not a lot to get excited about. Um, but when we get a market in a, a, a trendless or a directionless state, you have to find a different edge. Letting a market bias be your edge when there is no clear bias showing seems like a bad way to have a bad time. So when we're in those, I don't want to call it a paradox, but when we're in those scenarios, try to keep it simple. 
This thing could rush aggressively in one direction or the other. Like if this trade deal thing goes down in a negative way, which we, let's be honest, there's a very high probability of that happening, then sellers are probably going to take an aggressive swing here. Now, I have no way of predicting that in the same way that I have no way of predicting short side here. But if I get this thing catching up to resistance with sellers entering the fray, showing me an area where I could risk tight stops, looking for that swing, that swing lower off of resistance, then that's a setup that I'm going to play. The uh, next resistance zone that I'm following, again, right here, 2956 to 2966. The next support zone, if I want to be real aggressive about it, I could even look at that 2912, but I'd want to set some, uh, I would want to, uh, I'd want to see some follow through confirmation there. 2900 is still possible, but this is the area that seems more attractive for support all the way down to 2869 to 2877. And that, my friends, is what I have for today. You want to see what kind of quest you, ladies and gentlemen, have? Let me know what's on your mind. Uh, from Zlatko, um, Footsie, CAC, Gold, please. Uh, he says, not CAC, DAX. Yeah, do all of those, my friend. I uh, don't think I have updated annotations on the Footsie, however. I haven't been too active in that one over the past couple of quarters, but let me see what I can, let me see what I can drum up here for you. Paint some piano keys so far this week. Uh, good support, uh, good support zone down here. Although you probably already have that one on your chart, it's the 7K psych level. Um, but I'd even color that up a little bit to make it a bit of a wider zone, because you can see where there was buyer anticipation back here, like mid-August, late August. Good zone though. But I, I would, I, I would just be adapting the same exact thing that I'm doing on U.S. indices right now, because we're in. One of those headline-driven types of states where the next headline that comes out on the matter is probably going to be a big push point. Of course, this morning we have that that positive deal on Brexit uh, rally and GBP, so adding a little bit of pressure here to the FTSE 100. Um, support zone I'd follow, I'd call that up from 69.83 up to around 70.25. So I want to get right to that that uh, swing low, that body low from late August. I'd be real dangerous, or I'd be real careful with what we have right now. That feels very dangerous. There's been some decent seller response, say 7190, but there also hasn't been a lot of give and, and go in either direction here, right? And it's just like one of those EKG scatter graphs. Uh, resistance side of the coin. I mean, the, the, the better zone, the clearer zone is 7315 up to around 7335, nice little 20 handle zone right up there. But I would probably be even willing to pick off 7250 if we could make it up. Like you can see all these topside wicks where there's just sellers that are on the sidelines waiting for higher prices in order to, to, to sell this off at a better rate. You know, so that usually means if we do get a blow through, like if prices break above there, then sellers are just waiting to hit it again. So if I get some topside wicks going through 7250, I'd fade that too. I'd be cool with that. Uh, CAC 40. Oh, no, you wanted the DAX instead. Thankfully, because I have uh, much cleaner stuff in the DAX than I have in the, the, the CAC. All right, let's get in my way. So I don't normally look at these, but there's a pretty nasty inverted head and shoulders here. Yeah, combine that up with, you know, all of this expectation around that European Central Bank. I mean, in my heart of hearts, I want to short this thing off, but... I just can't justify it from a tech standpoint. You know, the best I would have on short side approach is just trying to pick off that 12181 level that came into support, coming in as resistance. You know, kind of like I was saying a little earlier, when we get a good build of resistance and the prices break above, it could be that blow through effect where sellers come in, just trying to take advantage of selling off a, a greater rip. Um, but, I mean, this really seems like where the ball game is. Around 12.350 up to around 12.443. It's like such an obvious level to look to for resistance, all of these lower highs. But lurking in the midst is that inverted head and shoulders pattern where there might be a big breakout should that get tested through. 
So right now I'd say cautiously bearish, but I want to flip on the turn of a dime if this thing breaks through 12.5. It could run really quick up to like a 12.8, maybe even a little bit deeper. I'm, you know, full disclosure, I'm not a big fan of the fundamental backdrop in the Eurozone, specifically Germany. But, uh, you know, again, like I looked at a little earlier with that cable setup, texture, you know, texture objective. So if it's there, you know, I'm going to take it. Uh, from Pete, the gap is dubious to me in DXY. Yeah, gaps, you know, gaps are abnormalities, that's for sure. Um, you know, because this thing's closed for, I think it's like 30 minutes a day. No, it's an hour. It closes for an hour a day, the, the few contract. And it will sometimes gap. It hasn't yet filled this one. But uh, it's understandable. You know, I'm just normally a pretty cynical type of guy. <laughs> I think that, you know, a lifetime in, uh, in markets has done that to me. So I'm just constantly looking to fade. So I'm pretty much dubious of, of everything except for my charts. My charts don't lie to me. <laughs> if it gets wrong or goes wrong, then it's on me. It's not my chart's fault. Um, <laughs> uh, Pete had said, <laughs> uh, like putting Kershaw in, uh, in last night's game. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, a great sentiment study last night because probably one of the historically best teams in the history of, uh, the recent history of baseball lost very early in the playoffs and it might be attributed to a little bit of hubris, just a little bit of hubris. Uh, from John Dundee, is that a bad bar down to 24-ish? John, I'm really I'm really sorry. I don't remember which market that might have been on. I think we were looking at oil at the time, uh, judging by the time that that comment had come in. Uh, let me take a look. Down to 24-ish. Referring to that February 2016. That was actually a really good theme at the time. Um I, I enjoyed that thoroughly as it was getting priced in. But uh, what had happened here, this, in my mind, was a big market theme getting priced in. This is when U.S. dominance in oil production was really coming to light. Um, I remember it was like summer of 2015. Chinese markets had already started to implode. Uh, let's just go ahead and look at that while we're at it because, well, just because, XGY0. Is how you can chart Shanghai A shares if so inclined. But um, you know, so this was was really interesting because I remember when this thing was running up late 2014, early 2015. You know, it was it was kind of like, well, hey, if you're not getting a piece of the Chinese A share market, then what are you doing with your life? And I was like, chill, just wait. History's not kind to of these types of things. Sure enough, it wasn't. What ended up happening is kaboom. A lot of that run-up was on leverage. Uh, traders massively levering accounts, balances, trades, setups in China as this thing put in a meteoric rise. I mean, just to put this in scope, we go back to the monthly chart, and it's not the first time that's happened in the Chinese A-share market. Very similar to what happened in the run-up to the tech boom, or excuse me, the housing boom, turning into the financial collapse. Well, same thing, price through. Round two, verbs stay the same, nouns change a little bit. But it was the summer of 2015 when this really came home to roost because it started to impact the rest of the world. And this is when we saw some pretty massive, there it is, summer of 2015, some pretty massive exposure overlay into uh, even U.S. stocks, right? Look at the S&P, summer 2015, it was like August when that started to seep in here, we had that nice, smooth, clean, consistent uptrend. Remember the Fed's getting all lathered up for a rate hike in December, finally, after like seven years of promising one. That's probably like five years of promising one at that point, but I digress. But that's when the Chinese equity market started to hit the U.S. Now, we didn't actually recover from that until February of 2016. And that was around the Janet Yellen Humphrey Hawkins testimony. But the whole time that was going on, that theme was getting priced in. Oil prices are just getting tapped. 
right? The whole time, summer 2015 and bottom out again, early February 2016. It was when Janet Yellen gave that Humphrey Hawkins testimony, February 2016, where she basically said the Fed's going to do whatever they got to do to keep this thing going. Uh, that's when the low came in on oil prices. But no, it wasn't a bad tick. That was just a really, really aggressive short side move in oil markets. Okay, and I've gone 10 minutes past my plan. So I got to take uh, the last couple questions of the day here. Uh, Mr. John Dundee, DXY seems at major support. Um, it depends on the definition of major. You know, I think that different folks have different takes on <clears throat> on these types of things. Um, you know, I looked at this level just at the beginning of the webinar, like 98.65. And it does sync up fairly well with some prior swing highs. So like I can extend this line. Okay, I cannot extend that line, but I can draw a new one. Give me a quick second. I can draw a new one just right smack 98.65. You can see where it was a prior area of resistance now catching some new support. I mean, it's enough for me to to base some bullish strategies off of, right? Which is why I think that Aussie dollar setup looks pretty attractive, um, you know, and, you know, kind of like I was saying, dollar yen, even with USD on a swan dive today, dollar yen still running higher. So, you know, these are the areas of the pockets where I look to do counter fades, you know, dollars weak today. Okay, we're going to buy it. You know, I have Aussie buckling up to a decent resistance level. Seems like a pretty attractive area to try to peg something like that in there. Um, okay, last question of the day, Mr. Gary Diebel. Um, hi, James. Apologies, I missed the beginning. Is it a U.S. holiday Monday? Uh, kind of. It's Columbus Day, which they don't let us observe with a day off any longer. I say us. I mean most American or most workers in the U.S. Um, some schools are off for Columbus Day, I believe, but it's one of those quasi holidays. It's uh, uh, Gary asked, not market then? No, sir. I believe markets are fully operational. But whenever I have that question, NYSC Columbus Day. I'll just double check for you. Yeah, full-fledged, I believe. Yep, not off again until Labor Day. Um, rest of Gary's question, do you look at dollar yen? Thanks. I did, yes, sir. Um, impressed with its recent strength brought upon by a really pronounced theme of yen weakness. Uh, don't like the level, like the theme at this point, looking to play pullbacks towards that 107.50 area that we had looked at on Tuesday and the effort of trying to squeeze my risk playing upside continuation. I mean, what I really like about the setup now is even with the dollar t uh, tanking today, dollar yen is still going up, showing that we're getting even more yen weakness than we are USD weakness. And that's something that I can work with. Uh, but I want to thank everybody very much so much for your time. Uh, I'm going to be back next week, Tuesday at 1, Thursday at 1. really hope you have the time to visit with me again. But thank you so much for your time. Have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.